At the recent pastor's conference, Benny Hinn clearly presented the motivation that drives his ministry and expressed the desire that everyone listening to him would catch the same vision. What has been in my soul and my heart is one thing and one thing only. I want you pastors to leave this place knowing you are just as responsible to preach the gospel as Jesus was. Just as responsible in the sight of God as a son was. Bringing the lost into the kingdom of God on a worldwide scale is a tremendous undertaking that requires a significant financial investment by the body of Christ. However, many Christians are unable to do their part in advancing the message of the gospel because of their personal situation. They are not living in true prosperity as taught in the Bible because of the tremendous debt in their lives. Debt is not the will of God for your life. The apostles prospered, but not one of them had a palace to live in. It said none lacked. Say none lacked. That's prosperity. Elijah the prophet prospered. Even the ravens fed him his meal. But he didn't have a bank account. God supplied the need for his son even through the mouth of a fish. No debt. Now, prosperity in the minds of some is millions in the bank. That's not the Word of God. God's Word says no lack. Say no lack. No lack. See, God supplies that need continually, supernaturally. Now, the sad fact is the church, many in the church are in debt. They can't even pay their own bills. They want to support the gospel. They don't have the money. Why? Because they are not taught the principles of the kingdom. The word of God is clear on this matter. And our ministry gives. We've learned that we have learned the key. When we struggle financially, we send money out to somebody in need. Because we've learned only through giving can you receive. No other way. Now, John Evanzini is going to help you tonight understand some keys, some biblical keys that will transform your tomorrow. Are you ready? John Evanzini is a respected pastor, Bible teacher, and financial expert who has taught millions around the world how to eliminate their debt and experience biblical prosperity for the purpose of helping to pay the bills of those who are evangelizing the nations. At the Dallas Pastors Conference, John Evanzini shared a message on the difference between valuable seed and precious seed that can radically transform your financial future, enabling you to get out of debt and do your part in advancing the cause of the gospel. You see, there's a guaranteed harvest in God's Word. And we are people that understand seed time and harvest. But when an offering is made, many times it's so difficult to understand how God places value on an offering. How does God evaluate your offering? Look with me, if you would, into the book of Mark. And when you come to Mark, and you come to that 12th chapter of Mark, 41st verse, and Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast, now watch, how the people cast money into the treasury. Not how much, but how the people cast money into the treasury. And there, there were many there that, cast, that were rich that cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites which make a farthing. And he called unto him disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. Now, church, here we have to see that God looks at offerings different than we do. There are people here throwing big money into this offering, but all of a sudden two mites are thrown in, and the Lord stops everything and makes a statement, this woman has given more than all those that have given into the offering. Now, church, please watch. Thousands, tens of thousands came in, but the Lord passed right by it because he wasn't looking in the envelope, but he was looking through the envelope into the heart of the believer, and he was looking to see what did that offering mean to them. Are you catching this thing? Now watch this thing very carefully. The value of your offering is not set by the monetary number on the note or the number written in the check, but it's set by what it means to you. 
because look what it was, the 44th verse. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. This was money that she was living on. Now please catch this. The valuable had already come into the offering. Rich men had cast in great sums of money. But all of a sudden, something precious comes. A child of God, when you're a single mother and you have a few cents in your pocket, just enough maybe for the milk and the bread for that night, that becomes very precious. And I want you to notice that the valuable did not move the Lord. But when the precious moved, God immediately stopped everything and said, this woman has just outgiven everyone that's here in the place today. God is not moved when the valuable moves, but God is moved when the precious moves. Go a little further with me. Come with me to the widow at Zarephath. You know the story over in uh, 1 Kings. And when you come to uh, 1 Kings, the 17th chapter, uh, the prophet is told to go from the place that he's at to move to where the lady is, 8th verse. And the word of the Lord came unto him, Elijah, saying, Arise, get thee Zarephath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. And as he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gates of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in thy vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Preachers, every one of us owe this woman an apology. We've all talked about how she was holding back. But I want you to know, whenever you are in a famine, and it's a drought-driven famine, and you come into the city, and you ask for a glass of water. The most valuable thing in the city was handed to that man that day. She did not hesitate to hand him the water. The water was 10,000 times more valuable than a crummy little cake that she was baking out of what was left in the barrel. Is anybody grasping what I'm trying to say to you here? The prophet took the water. God's hand didn't move. Nothing happened in the barrel. But then the prophet finds something precious. And child of God, listen, we've got to get past this thing to where preachers can talk plain about money because many times our people need to be talked real plain to about their money because until they can loose the precious, the answer is not getting the light bill paid. The answer is to move the hand of God into paying off their house and paying off their cars and paying off the church mortgage and having the money that's needed. There's enough money in the church now to win the world if the bankers weren't getting it car payments, house payments, and don't think he can't cancel debt because he's already canceled the biggest debt you ever had. He canceled your sin debt. Is anybody grasping what I'm trying to say to you? The valuable moved when the water moved. Nothing happened in heaven. But all of a sudden, the precious was noticed. Her son's last meal and all of the angels of heaven gathered around the banister of heaven and they looked down because they knew that if the precious would move, Jehovah would move. God, are you understanding what I'm trying to say to you? Child of God, that offering that's made every time that you put a, an offering together, it's not the amount what it means to the meeting, but it's what it means to you. Go with me, please, over to the book of Genesis, the 42nd chapter. Genesis 42. The sons of Jacob have come for corn. Many years past, Joseph has been supposedly slain by an animal. But we now find that Joseph is the, the second in command. And uh, uh, Joseph spots them, has them brought up, banquet table set. They're sitting at the banquet table. He gives them the uh, uh, left profile. He gives them the right profile. They can't recognize him. Finally, he tires of it, and he says, come, we're going to get you some corn. And he takes them out and gets them a cut in line and gets their little sacks filled with corn. Look at that 40, 25th verse of the 42nd chapter. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and uh, re uh, restored every man his goods. 
So anyway, they leave with sacks of corn. They, now these boys, just before they get out of earshot, Joseph says, oh, by the way, hey, hey, yes, sir. When you come back again, if you don't bring Benjamin, you'll not see my face. You'll go to the end of the line. Benjamin? How do they know about Benjamin? Benjamin's the most precious thing that daddy has. We don't talk about Benjamin. If strangers come in the camp, Benjamin goes in the back. Those boys prayed for rain. They prayed for rain, but it didn't rain. Comes time now to go back again and get more corn. They come to their daddy and they say, Daddy, Daddy, we're going to have to go get corn again. He says, okay, go get it. Get you, get you some money and uh, get some gold and go. He says, no, 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 Daddy, there's a problem. The man said that if we don't bring Benjamin... Benjamin said, why did you have to tell him about Benjamin? <laughs> Honey, <laughs> he said, Daddy, he knew about Benjamin. Don't you think God doesn't know about your Benjamins? <laughs> All that money you got tucked away here and tucked away over there, hid in the mattress, pinned away somewhere in case there's an emergency. <laughs> Set aside money, church, please hear me. I mean, he knows about your Benjamins. And finally, he says, well, there's no, the, I got to do something. He releases Benjamin. Now then, if you look at that 45th, 45th chapter, look closely. First verse. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. He says, boys, I'm your brother. I'm your brother, Joseph. But not only am I your brother, Joseph, but I am the supply sergeant of the world. <laughs> Hear me, pastors. It's not Monsanto. It's not Dow Chemical. It's not the, uh, the, the, the uh, Walmart that decides the future of the finances of your children. It's decided by the supply sergeant of the world, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Is anybody beginning to get a glimpse of what I'm talking about? As soon as the precious moved, God's hand moved. Well, Brother John, that's interesting, but what, what, what really changed here? No, no, no. Go to the 19th verse. 19th verse. Now thou art commanded, this do you. Take your wagons out of the land of Egypt. They were no longer eaten out of sacks. They were now eaten out of wagons. Being they brought the precious and put the precious into the hand of uh, Joseph that day. Is anybody grasping what I'm trying to say to you? Oh, please hear it. There is, a, a, listen, when I was 50 years old, that was, that was just about, uh, what would that be, about 20, uh, 20 years ago? 50. I had $30,000, a secondhand car, and I had no home that I owned. Today everything's paid for and I have more than enough of everything. 20 years, what happened? I did not inherit any money. I did not win the lottery. And I know how de desperate some of you are. I've been there. But catch with me now. This thing will change. That's just 20 years. Most people say that's too late to start thinking about retirement. It's funded. Oh, that's too late to think about having your house paid for. It's paid for. That's too late thinking about having surplus. We're sending in here. We're sending there. We're continuously in the process of, of sending forth gifts into the earth. It's in your heart too, pastors. I was right there. I was bleeding for it. But I had to have a breakthrough. I had to have something change. And I changed the way I was giving. I stopped caring about whether the house payment was paid, the car payment was paid. I didn't care whether the light bills were paid. The first thing that I saw to every time I got a paycheck in my hand, Pat and I would sit down and we would ask God, God, what would you have us give? And we didn't say, oh, we can't do that, Lord, because of this or because of that. And I'm telling you what, God started meeting just before the payment was due. Miracle had happened. Then pretty soon he said, I don't need you making car payments. I'm too busy using your money for other things. I don't need you making a house payment. I don't need you paying on your office building. It all got paid in short order by miracles. But it was seed time and harvest. 
Let me give it to you. Just, just two more scriptures. Is that all right? First Kings, the third chapter. First Kings, the third chapter. Solomon just started. He hasn't been king very long. He has a ration, a daily ration, but he has armies to feed, servants to feed. He has households to keep. He has ex tremendous expenses. He's just beginning to build his wealth. It's time to bring an offering. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in his statue of David and his father, and uh, uh, only he sacrificed burnt incense in the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, fourth verse. For there was the great high place of thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. Church, the acceptable offering was one lamb for one house, one lamb for one house. But this man, Solomon, brings a thousand lambs, a thousand lambs. And church, something very unusual happens. Look at it here in the next verse. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God asked, said, Ask, what shall I give thee? Now, I know that God's talked to almost every one of you, but what does he usually say? He's got things for you to do for him. But something happened in this precious offering. It turns around and God comes in and says, What can I do for you? What can I do for you, child of God? Please hear me. There, uh, the, the end time harvest that was talked about last night and the birthing of these things that I'm hearing uh, Pastor Benny talk about, about taking this world for Jesus Christ and millions and millions standing in fields accepting him as Savior. But there's got to be more finances in your hands because it can't be done by one man. No matter how wonderful you are, sir, you can't do the job. But there could be thousands rise up all over the place. This debt is broken off of our lives. But look what happens real quickly. If you just go to the eighth chapter and you go on over to the 63rd verse, he's just given, I mean, you'd think it would break him to give this way. But here just a few years later, and Solomon offered a sacrifice, a peace offering, which he offered unto the Lord, two and 20,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. Giving the precious didn't break this man. It moved him into a whole new dimension of giving. And then whenever you get to the 10th chapter, the 23rd verse, so King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and wisdom. He became the richest man in the world. And it started when the precious moved. Now, pastors, I told you I was going to tell you about the guaranteed offering, the guaranteed returned offering. Go with me, one other scripture. One other scripture, 126, 126 of Psalms. 126 of Psalms. And as you come to 126, fifth verse. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Now get to sixth verse. And he that goeth forth <laughs> and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless, without a doubt, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I had a quarter of a million dollars of debt. Steve, you were there. I came forth and I told Paul Crouch, I'm going to give you $42,000 as a seed to get out of debt. Now, man, a quarter of a million dollars in debt, just starting out a ministry, it took me about six months to gather it up. I went to Surabaya, Indonesia, almost a year later, and from there over to Kuala Lumpur, and then to the high desert of California, and in three meetings, a quarter of a million dollar debt was gone totally, completely, miraculously. Is anybody understanding what I'm saying? If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. But somewhere specificity has to come. I make this offering believing that I will be totally debt free, that my ministry will be debt free. And you don't sow debt free money into a debt ridden ministry. Do you understand what I just said to you? 
Some of you have never given $10,000. Listen to me, $10,000 is a threshold. It's a threshold of giving that changes everything around you. Extend your hands this way. Extend your hands. Father, I thank you that you are a debt-canceling God. I thank you that you are a God of the breakthrough. And Father, I thank you that as the precious has moved in this room, that now you begin to move even before they leave this great uh, time of visitation that there are already hands into the computers at the banks. Uh, money is beginning to move and loosen up. Debts are being paid off. Finances are released. In the name of Jesus, angels, I send you forth to minister for these, your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, be debt free. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Why don't you give the Lord a mighty shout of victory?